We're in a time of change now and technology is upending the cart. There's a long stretch of time where law, even more so than most professions, had really strict gatekeepers. And the gatekeepers were, you know, what law school you went into and what your class rank was and things of that nature. All of those things are breaking down with technology. The opportunities are totally, totally there. If you are a smart, hardworking, entrepreneurial soul, and you can see the legal work that you want to do, now's a great time to go to law school. Lawsome, the podcast for law firms, powered by Consult Webs. Welcome back to Lawsome, the only podcast for law firms that's become the kids your mother warned you about. We're here to inform, educate, and entertain the legal community on the latest in legal marketing and law firm development. I am Rebel Without a Cause, Jake Sanders. <laughs> Joining me in the back of the class is Paul Misdemeanor Julius. Paul, what rules have we broken so far today? Uh, let's see. Flinching. I flinched earlier. We definitely broke no flinching. Um, we should be more stoic. It's tough, man. I wrote this question and I don't have an answer. <laughs> so is that a rule? I broke that rule. Yeah, you sure did. I don't know what I'm doing here, man. It's <laughs> it's all being exposed now. I think they're all wondering now. We can tell you what's on the show. We have the goods. Here's the agenda right now. On the show today, we're going to discuss deregulation with an article from AboveTheLaw.com. We chat with Professor Ben Barton, making his return to the podcast to discuss his new book, Fixing Law Schools. And due to contractual obligations, we ask him five questions we ask everyone again. Pull up a plate. It's the Hot Takes Buffet. The article today is from Above the Law. It's written by Joe Patrice. It's entitled, The Legal Profession Isn't Overregulated, It's Just Badly Regulated. The byline, don't walk away from the value of regulation just because the legal industry is a mess. <laughs> Joe, <laughs> Joe's always so fresh and, yeah. and honest with it. Um, I'll open it up with his words and then we'll provide some hot takes. Um, so Joe starts like this. He says, like every other industry, the legal profession has gotten the deregulation bug lately. And true to the deregulation story, it's all about the quote unquote widows and orphans on the wrong side of the access to justice gap. The quote is, if only we didn't have all these regulations on the practice of law, you know, these poor people could get the help they need. It's a well-meaning argument, continues Patrice, and uh, there's no denying that a lower cost alternative is necessary for the growing gap. But opening up the floodgates is not a particularly attractive solution. Um, he, he then goes on to quote Andrew Aruda from, uh, you know, Ross Intelligence, who's talking about re-regulation, uh, not getting rid of all the regulations, but taking a look at the idea that regulations are good and there's a way that we can use them to help. It's, it's a very small shift, but, but I thought that was interesting, you know, and, you know, the hot takes, uh, you know, that, that Andrew outlines is that the JDs are now expected out of school to know how to run the biz be a accountant, know how computer science, you, they'd be a psychologist. You know, regulations are holding lawyers back from innovating. Uh, you know, they have huge debt. One of the interesting parts uh, about Ben's interview, Professor Barton's interview, is the idea of output regulation. Rather than judging th uh, law schools about input by how many resources are going into a law school, they're talking about the results that come out. And are the uh, what's the bar passage rate from a school? Are they more prepared? Uh, are they what's the employment rate? Are they getting better gigs? Are, are they more prepared for the future? It's interesting take because we're thinking of regulation, but we're not thinking of the people and lawyers who are going to be inhabiting this space. And a lot of the fixes seem to be on the people themselves and on their, their mindsets. And, and so it's sort of an individualized uh, way that a group of professionals will succeed in the future. I think it's a really weird con uh, 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 confluence of um, ideas, but Ben is a great guest who sort of unpacks this concept of regulation and attaches it to law schools in a really, really compelling way. And, and I think that gets 
to the heart of what Joe and Andrew are talking about is, is there is a way for us to have uh, rules that allow innovation to take place. And with regulation, we can make sure that it happens for more people, not just really talented individuals. So that's my hot take. What, what, what are you thinking about this? This is dense. This was a dense piece. This was tough. I, I always try and get it down to to something I can understand and, and what this really st- – so, you know, yeah, most is- crayons. Um, it, what I equated this with was um, building code. Hmm. There's regulation. You know, I think people talk about regulation. We've had a lot of guests on the show that talk about regulation as a, you know, oh, this is a – it's a hindrance. It's a bad thing. But I think it's important to step back sometimes and take a look and say, why – are these things there in the first place? And that's why I'm talking about building code. Mm. You know, those, those rules about where you can and can't run electricity, you know, each one of those things is there because someone burned down their house. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I think when it comes to some of these things, it's important to, to take a look at maybe the overarching thing of like, why are these rules there? And, and particularly with law, you know, um, yeah, maybe they are a little stringent with with some of the things because, you know, I, you could you could metaphorically burn down someone's house, right? But you know, by doing something incorrect, I think the 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 attitude has to be there. Let's try and keep the spirit of why those regulations were there, but at the same time, understand that you know, um, like Ben says later, the law it's becoming more complicated. You know, this mm-hmm. isn't getting easier. Mm. It's it, and 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 people are going to have to try and um, pivot a bit. I think to to meet the different needs and the more complexities. And I think you know, regulations need to be reapproached to reflect that. Mm. And what's interesting too is there's there's individuals making pushes to create law schools that that. Um, you know, produce JDs who have this mentality. And then there's law firms that sort of are switching the way they approach their business model. But it's only happening at one small step uh, at a time. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, for me, I think there's something dangerous because in the future, it just seems like only the exceptional will survive. If you're very exceptional at knowing how to move through these regulations, deregulations, no laws, bylaws, the liminal gray world where well, maybe you can do it, maybe you can't do it. That's always going to be a, a bright line path for any person who has the smarts. And I think something about regulation helps control and tamp down that exceptionalism that I think right now is the only way things can change is if a person is showing some exceptional, uh, some exceptional uh, innovation, you know, like Andrew or Ross or, or these folks, but more people need to join in. And, and, and Joe actually ends it perfectly, his piece, with that sentiment. And I'll end it with his words, and then we'll go into the interview with Ben. He says, the cure for bad regulation is good regulation, or at the very least, better regulation, not no regulation. That's a lot harder work than just tearing everything down. But thankfully, there are some people out there willing to take it on. Now the rest of the profession has to join in. After these messages... We'll be right back. Any lawyer looking to grow their business online can generate more leads from their website by hiring ConsultWebs. After working with lawyers exclusively since 1999, we've tested thousands of web designs and marketing strategies, so we know what flips and what flops. For more information, visit www.consultwebs.com today. And now, for a Lawsome interview. Professor Ben Barton is the author of the books Fixing Law Schools and Rebooting Justice. He's worked as an associate at a large law firm, a clinical law professor, clerked for a federal judge, and now Professor Barton teaches torts and advocacy evidence at the University of Tennessee. 
His scholarship has been discussed in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, the American Bar Association Journal, and Time Magazine. He's won several awards, including a Fulbright Award, with several critically important books and law review articles published worldwide. We are honored to have tracked down the professor and trapped him for a few inspirational minutes on his second appearance on the Lawson Podcast. Welcome to the show, Professor Barton. Too kind, too kind. And also, you can't bury the lead, man. This is my second time on. I'm a repeat guest. This is impressive. <laughs> right. right. We didn't scare you away, and you got your rabies shot from the last time. We apologize. <laughs> so let's talk about your new book, though. You're here for a reason, Fixing Law Schools. In it, you write that law schools, quote, suffered a harrowing near-death experience, and the survivors look like they're going to exhale gratefully and then go back to doing exactly what led them into the crisis in the first place. What is this near-death experience, and what crisis do, d does the legal community seem to be repeating here? Yeah, so um, the story starts in 2008 with the Great Recession. And actually, at first, the Great Recession looked like it was going to be good news for law schools. Basically, uh, traditionally, in a recession, applications to graduate schools of all kinds go up because undergrads can't find jobs, so they figure they may as well go to law school or business school or architecture school or whatever else. And that was the experience in 2008. And basically, through into 2010, 2011, applications went up and the number of people in law schools went up. Well, by 2010 and 11, the economy is starting to turn around for most other places, but it is very markedly not turning around in the legal field. And in particular, it's pretty disastrously bad for law graduates. Mm -hmm. So those first couple of years, eight, nine, 10, people just wrote that off as bad luck in the recession. But by 2011, when the employment results are still staying bad, all of a sudden you get this wave of bad publicity. And uh, bad publicity kind of washes over law schools, and you get this massive collapse in everything associated with law schools. So you get a massive collapse in the number of people who apply, mm -hmm. and then when you have fewer people who apply, you have fewer people in the building. And then when you have fewer people in the building, you're really desperate to get people in the building, so you start discounting even on the people you have. And so you end up in this kind of financial tsunami for law schools that starts in 2011 and basically lasts all the way through into 16 or 17, um, when the election of President Trump actually weirdly makes law schools more popular. Um, so the point of the book is to explain this period, like just go in depth on what happened to law schools, why it happened, and then to make absolutely sure insofar as I can that people know we can't just brush off our shoulders and move on. Like, we have to learn a lesson from what happened to us. I actually think there's three different things that led to the collapse. So the most obvious one is the employment stuff. But the book points out that employment numbers for law schools have been relatively weak since the 90s. Um, if you go back all the way into the 90s, roughly a third of graduating people with a JD had a hard time getting full-time, long-term employment that required a JD. Um, now some of those people chose to not be a lawyer. They weren't looking forward to it or didn't enjoy law school. But a bunch of those people wanted to be lawyers and could. Um, so one thing to note is that, that it rose to salience and the reporting on it started in 2011, but it's a long-term problem. The second problem is that, that came to light in 2011 is a hilariously long-term problem. This is that law schools don't do a great job of teaching you how to practice law. So there's not only that the job results were bad and that law schools became more expensive and debt levels went up. It was like they were like, oh, and even law schools don't even really teach you to be a lawyer. I say this is a funny old one because that's basically been true since 1880. <laughs> and in fact, the irony is that because of new um, new requirements by the ABA and because of new clinical programs, we're actually better at that than we have ever been. We're still not very good at it. But it's sort of ironic to be complaining right. about it now in 2011. And then the last challenge is the actual, the only really sort of future challenge is the tech challenge. By 2011, and certainly now, it became clear that computers, LegalZoom, Rocket Lawyer, other non-lawyer ways of handling legal issues were coming to the fore, and that that was going to be a significant piece of competition now let alone, I mean, I've got students graduating this year who are going to be lawyers for 30, 40 years, and believe me, they're going to face a lot of competition. Yeah. So those three things together kind of led to this 
boiling point. And so if more people are going to apply to law school and come to law school, now is not the time to just pretend that all of those issues are solved because those issues are not solved. So, well, so talking more about the students and stuff like and some of these realities they're facing, um, you know, as a professor, how do you motivate students to continue to pursue a career as a lawyer um, in the face of, you know, such such bleak circumstances, you know, Um, are there are there positives you can see that that can help people for sure? Yeah. Yeah. No, I give a talk to the entire first year class every year. That's about an hour long where I start with uh, market realities, the job placement, and the total overall spend in America on legal, um, legal services, and give them the bad news up front. Um, and then in the book, I've got a whole chapter about whether you should or should not go to law school. And by you, I mean anyone should or should not go to law school. Um, here's what I'll say from the book. Okay, so if you are a confused history major, who has nothing better to do, and you're like, I like arguing, now's a terrible time to go to law school. (laughs) That being said, it's always (laughs) been a terrible time for that person to go to law school. Right. (laughs) It's a particularly bad time now. And the reason it's a particularly bad time now is that despite this recession, despite the collapse in applications and in attendance, law schools have relentlessly and continuously raised tuition above the rate of inflation year after year since the 80s. And whether it's good times in the legal profession or bad times for for law schools, they just keep raising it. And then when you raise tuition, the debt levels go up. The debt levels now are, in my opinion, unconscionable, unacceptable. It's the worst thing about American law schools. And it's a whatever can't go on forever won't go on forever Mm -hmm. issue. So you should not borrow six figures to go to law school unless you're very clear on the fact that you want to be a lawyer and you understand what lawyers do and what lawyers get paid. Hmm. So I've got a whole like checklist thing to do in the book where you first try and figure out what kind of job you might want to have. And then you actually learn what that job is. And then you find out what that job gets paid. And then you figure out how much tuition slash debt you should take on to do it. The funny thing is that for the students who, the undergrads and the people thinking of, about going to law school who do that work, the people who come through that and are like, I do want to go to law school, it's actually not a bad time to go to law school. We're in a time of change now, and technology is upending the cart. There's a long stretch of time where law, even more so than most professions, had really strict gatekeepers, and the gatekeepers were you know, what law school you went into and what your class rank was and things of that nature. All of those things are breaking down with technology. The opportunities are totally, totally there. If you are a smart, hardworking, entrepreneurial soul and you can see the legal work that you want to do, now's a great time to go to law school. It's, uh, you, you reminded me of, in ja- I have a jazz performance degree, Professor Barton. Oh, I uh, like it. Right. <laughs> so I hope you did not borrow six figures to get a jazz performance No, I, no, I, I paid off my debt, uh, to society, uh, through jazz, but, nice. um, what, what, what's exciting is, um, we had a jazz performance class and that first semester, uh, the guitar professor sat everyone down and said, look. Basically, none of you were going to make it. Are you still okay with hacking it out? And I remember graduating with a jazz performance degree, and, and everybody around me was mad. Why didn't my parents tell me to not do this? What am I going to do? Open a jazz store? It's really funny because I have a bit of an entrepreneurial mindset, and I've found ways to make music, and I continue to be professionally you know, engaged in music. And it's only because of a mindset. And I think it was rooted in reality. And so what I'm coming back to is that it almost seems like no matter what your discipline is, there's a lot of people like Gary Vaynerchuk telling fools, telling kids that they don't even need to go to college. You don't even know to sit in a room. And and I'm not necessarily on that level, but I do think that there's something here that says the person with the mindset is going to succeed, and that's the way it's always been. Do, do you do you feel the the mindset paradigm here? No, and what do you see I about totally these? Do, but I would yeah. say it's especially true now with yeah. the students. Every single semester, I point out to them: look, technology is 
going to change the way law operates. And that's not just true for law, that's true for everything. And they're, they're Gen Z and millennials. I'm not telling them anything they don't know. Right. Um, and then I also point out to them that who's in a better position to take advantage of this shift? People my age? People my parents' age? I mean, there's a massive number of baby boomers who still run a pen and paper version of practice mm -hmm. still out there. Like these folks are just begging, begging to have young people come in and revolutionize how the market works. Exactly. So yeah, with the right attitude, this now is the perfect time to get in. So talking about that attitude, talking about that mindset, um, there's also the regulation um, of the legal profession, uh, you know, the professional bodies and those gatekeepers are still there somehow. Those paper and pen law firms may be holding back some of the innovation. Uh, one statement in your book uh, jumped out at us saying that there should be greater regulations on law schools that failed to deliver on employment and bar passage. Do, do you think regulating the schools will then help regulate the industry? Or, or do you see what role do you see regulation playing in um, in making this future happen? Yeah, so let me say say a word about that. Um, the American Bar Association is basically in charge of accrediting law schools in the United States, and they do that basically because state supreme courts have given them the power to do that. Uh, state supreme courts control lawyer regulation more or less in all fifty states. And so state Supreme Courts choose who gets into the legal profession and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I think it's 47 different states have chosen to have ABA accredited law school graduation be the single educational way into the profession. Now, there's still some states that are limping along with weird apprenticeship mm -hmm. uh, and other things. But by and large, it's ABA accreditation. You may have heard that Kim Kardashian is trying yes. to become a lawyer through yes. apprenticeship. Yes. My daughters, uh, I have about 16 and 18 year old daughters and they were pointing this out to me and I called her the most famous legal apprentice since Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But anyhow, she may she may actually bring it back. You never know. She's a trendsetter. So maybe a lot right. of people go into apprenticeship. I don't exactly. Know. Right. But for now, it's the ABA accredited law schools that that run the show. So traditionally, the ABA accreditation process has been focused on what we call input regulation. And in my opinion, this is a really stupid way to do regulation. So this is how many professors you have and whether you have a law library and whether the law library has a certain number of books and how much you pay the professors and all these inputs that go into uh, law school. Um, so this is the way they've done it for a long time. And I guess maybe it sort of made sense in 1920, but it really doesn't make much sense now. And wisely, in my opinion, they're moving to an output regulation model. So rather than measuring the inputs into legal education, they're asking, are students graduating, are students getting jobs, and are students passing the bar? Now, I would like to see them add in the cost element to it, but those three things are basically like, well, that's why people go to law school, right? I mean, there's the learning part of it, but the learning part of it, not to be mean to myself, who's a professor and the other professors, is way secondary to the getting a job, graduating, and, get, and passing the bar. So an output regulation just it just looks at that and then sets a minimum number. Like this number of people have to pass the bar and this number of people have to graduate and or not get failed out. And if you start falling below these numbers, we're just going to assume you're not a very good law school. And at some point, we're going to take away your accreditation. Over the course of the time that I was working on the book, basically, there's been ABA accreditation for 90 odd years, and they had never disaccredited a fully accredited law school over that entire period of time. They put people on probation, they yelled at people, they not let new law schools become ABA accredited law schools, but they never once stripped a law school of accreditation. And now with the new output regulations, they physically have done it. They actually closed the doors on Arizona Summit Law School in Phoenix, wow. um, which uh, Arizona Summit actually weirdly looks like some other law schools. So that means maybe some other ones should close. But I'll just be frank, and I'm, I'm sad for the people who worked in that building, but that was a bad law school. They were not meeting the graduation rates. Their bar passage was a disaster. Hardly anyone was getting a job, and they were charging a fortune. And that's a public service to close that place, in my opinion. So earlier in the conversation, you know, we were kind of talking about, you know, from 2008 until now, the different kind of peaks and valleys that that law school and, and grad schools have seen. Um, and, and you mentioned the Trump bump 
and and this subsequent role of of hero lawyers in the in in the resistance, and it's made law school relevant again. So, and I'll tell you, there definitely does seem to be a significant increase in the number of lawyers uh, in the media and the public eye as of late. So, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Is it is it helping or hurting? Yeah. So. I'll say a couple of things about it. The first thing is that I, ma- I make a joke in the book about this hilarious irony that law schools um, are, were really struggling and some of them were on the verge of closing and they get saved by the election of Donald Trump when if you look at the federal donations, almost no law professor supported him. <laughs> it's like they, they, he somehow managed to help the people who were least likely to have voted for him. Um, and it's not just the Trump. It's not just the Trump bump. It's also the change in the Department of Education. Mm. Um, the Obama Department of Education was really hard on for-profit schools of all types, and particularly they were out for for-profit law schools. And if you follow the story of the closure of Charlotte uh, School of Law in Charlotte, North Carolina, that was a for-profit school that was basically closed by the Department of Education, and it was also basically closed by the Obama Department of Education right in the transition period between the election and the inauguration. Mm. Um, When Betsy DeVos came in, you can imagine she's not too anxious to close any for-profit schools. So all of those schools have gotten a pass, thanks to Trump also. So there's a hilarious factor where Trump has unwittingly helped law schools, and then law schools who need the help have to take the help from somebody who they really don't care much for. Oh, wow. But yeah, the, um, the, the lawyer hero thing, it, it, uh, there's a causation correlation thing. We don't know the answer to this. For sure, you're right. The media coverage of it has gotten a lot more positive. And certainly we've seen an end of the, or a relative end to the don't go to law school, going to law school is a terrible idea coverage. Yeah. And we've seen an uptick in, uh, you know, lawyers are at airports saving immigrants type um, type of reportage. Mm-hmm. It's un- I mean, it could also just be a bounce. Like, these things are cyclical, and so you sort of historically you hit a bottom where people stop apl- they hit, stop applying and then start picking picking back up. So that could just be where we're at. But mm. um, narrative wise, it's nice to tie it into Trump. Mm. Um, in terms of whether it's helping or hurting, it's definitely helping the bottom line of law schools. More people are applying. Weirdly, the attendance hasn't gone up that much. But we lost a third of the number of people in buildings between 2011 and 2016. So even hitting a bottom of attendance is very, very good news. You know how it is when you're in a free fall. It just seemed like it would never end. So we've clearly appeared to have hit a floor on that. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the survival of law schools, uh, that's definitely helping. In my opinion, in terms of learning lessons, it's not necessarily helping. It's not clear that law schools aren't going to be like, whoo, and just move on. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I do. You, do you think too? I guess another perspective I want, I guess, is just from the attitude. Like you were talking earlier about people who are just like, oh, you know, I don't know, whatever. I like to argue. I'll just, you know, stay. I'll go join law school so I don't have to go out in the real world or whatever. Yeah. Um, now you have some people who are like righteously angry and 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 they want to change things. Um, you know, I don't know. Is that is that sustainable? You know, like you were talking about, we see these these lawyers rushing to airports and rushing to the border, and then the news cycle. You know how that is. It's short. Yeah. Um, and we're off to something else. Is that is this like realistic? Like, are people actually going to be like, you know what, we can make a difference doing this, or you know, flash in the pan? Yeah. So uh, we're in the middle of it, so I can't say what the answer to that is. Mm-hmm. I can tell you my advice on that front. Um, law school is, in fact an excellent, outstanding place to go if what you really want to do is change the world and make a difference. Like there's that, That's an empirical fact, in my opinion. And there's not just a couple of jobs you can get out of law school that look like that. There are a lot of jobs that you can get coming out of law school that look like that. That being said, you've got to be super, as I was saying, you've got to be super realistic about it. So for example, if you're going to law school just so you can do that sort of like um, high-level constitutional immigration work, that's that's not a regular job. There aren't there aren't thousands and thousands and thousands of people getting that job every year, and there are thousands and thousands of law grads. So you sort of have to be mm. careful about it. Mm. Um, if you want to be a public defender, or listen, if you want to just hang up a shingle and help people at a discount doing immigration work, there's plenty of that work. So again, it's sort of real. If you have a realistic expectation about it, you can definitely do it. And this is this is a connected point. The end of the talk that I give to the 1L class about the state of the legal profession and what mm-hmm. it looks like, I put up a picture 
And it's a picture of myself and my wife's best friend and her husband and their son who they're adopting. And it's on the day of the adoption. And I explained to the students that I did that adoption for my wife's best friend just as a favor to her for free. Um, and I did it because I knew the kid that they were adopting and he was in an abusive home. And obviously I knew my wife's best friend and I knew that it would, like we were going to have to terminate the existing parents' parental rights. So it was going to be really expensive and hard to do. And they couldn't afford to hire a lawyer, a lawyer to do it. So I said, you know what, I'll just go ahead and do this. And it was, it was our, it was like hundreds of hours of work to do. Mm. But at the end of it, here was this kid, this beautiful kid whose life, I mean, I'm not raising him, so I'm not on the front line of it, but I helped change this kid's life. And I point out to the students, like, that, I didn't cure cancer. I didn't overturn. I didn't do Obergefell. You know, I didn't change gay mm -hmm. marriage. But there's a lot of opportunities to use your law degree to help people. And it's not always, you know, adoptions. Like, if you want to be a business person and help people open their business, if, believe me, the first day you're there, when they open the place up and it's running because you turned them into a corporation, that's an awesome day. Like, you can physically use this degree to make a difference in the world in lots of different ways. I, I think the ways, we don't know the new ways that are totally. going to be uh, changing and needing really smart people who want to solve problems. Um, Absolutely. And Do just you know are looking at those inputs and outputs. It's really, it's a great way that you simplified the, the thoughts here. Yeah, no, if you know Jillian Hatfield, yes. she's the professor. Yeah, she's the best. And yeah, she points this out. She's like, you have this weird irony where you have too many lawyers chasing one type of work and too few lawyers who are capable of doing another type of work. And she points out, and this couldn't be more right, law is not getting simpler. It's getting more complicated. And that it appears to be <laughs> a law of physics. Like it just appears to keep getting more complex as we go. So there's not going to be a lessening in demand for the work. And there's not going to be a lessening for demand for smart, hardworking hustlers who want to do that work. The problem is finding the right people to do it. Do you understand what I mean? Totally, totally. And, and, and the right structures that support them and give them the space to do the work that's necessary. Like you hatching these legal eagles in your tree of inspiration. Oh, I like it. Um, so where people want to learn more about you, they want to find out, um, they want to connect with Professor Ben Barton. How can they find you and how can they get the book online? Um, yeah, it's available, you know, bookstores, Amazon, NYU Press, wherever they go, they can find it. Um, and otherwise, you know, I'm on Twitter like everybody else. So just, just hit me up. I love it. Five questions we ask everyone. Number one, what was the last book you read? The last book I read is Conversation with Friends. It's a novel by Sally Rooney. Nice. It's an it's a awesome book. It's about uh, Irish poets who have sex and argue. I love it. Good. Uh, <laughs> number two, what is your favorite place? Oh, my favorite place in the world? Or right now? Anywhere? I don't know. All right. Hey, listen, um, this is I apologize for bringing a paid political ad here. Uh, this is a little bit of trivia about Ben Barton. My wife was just elected mayor of Knoxville, Tennessee. Nice. Yeah. November 5th, she was elected mayor, sworn in December 21st. So I am now obligated for all time to say that Knoxville, Tennessee is my favorite place. <laughs> <laughs> we understand. Obligate. You can check that box off. All right. Uh, number three, what sites, blogs, newsletters, or podcasts do you regularly check in with? Okay, well, I, I dig y'all. Um, and then uh, I have to give a shout out to my colleague, Glenn Reynolds. Uh, I'm an Insta pundit. I sometimes contribute, but I'm mostly just a reader. Um, and note, it's only if you are willing to read a lot of conservative slash libertarian stuff. Um, okay. But if you want a fresh legal take on what's going on in the world, politics, law, otherwise, that's the place to go. Nice. Uh, okay, number four. If you were stranded on a desert island and could only pick one condiment to take with you, what would it be? Oh, yeah. This is going to be a controversial one, and I apologize. But it's honey cup, honey mustard. That's the actual thing that I would bring. Oh, 
I love it. Well, I, I like now we you see we we used to get a lot of just mustard, but I like that people are getting specific. They're way specific. Places to go. I've actually been to the mustard museum in Mount Horeb, Wisconsin. Fun oh, fact. Oh, is that true? How was it? Uh, it was everything I expected it to be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of fired up about that. I'm gonna have to make my way up there. I love mustard. So it was it was pretty cool actually. I mean it was. I'll, I'll tip everybody over to my travel blog. Um, all right, last one, number five. After a long day or a long week at work, how do you relax and unwind? Oh, this is a good one. Um, I think my answer will probably be the same for this. I have a glass of wine every day between 5 and 7 p.m. when I get home. And it's a really thoughtful glass of wine because it's a demarcation between the end of work and the start of being at home. Uh, and actually what happened was I started having a glass of wine every night and still emailing and I quickly learned not to do that. <laughs> and so now you have a glass or two of wine and that just goes ahead and sets a marker in the sand and so I'm done for the day. For show notes, links, and info, go to thelawsonpodcast.com or follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Be sure to leave us a review and rating in iTunes or wherever you find the app you listen to. Until next week. Stay awesome. You're still here? Well then, here is a little more from our interview with Professor Barton. It's weird because these lawyers out here are complaining, but they're getting weird information too, Ben. And I don't know if you get it. Like people are saying, why don't you code? And they're like, oh, don't tell these people to code. I mean, what's your thought on that tech wise? I mean, what's, what's your thought there? That's completely on my mind. I teach a class here that I started basically when I wrote the book, I was like, I've got to put my money where my mouth is technology. So yeah. I started a class here called A2J Lab, and there's maybe 30 of these classes at different law schools in the country. And so I get uh, students, and then they work in teams, and then we create websites uh, for legal papers or other things for poor people that they need. So um, we did an adult name change last semester. We did oh. an expungement form. We do things of that nature. Oh. Uh, the students ask me, like, oh, is this a coding class? And I'm like, well, not if I'm teaching it. <laughs> I don't really know how to do that. Um, and then second, I mean, in terms of transferable skills, why, under what circumstances would you hire a person with a JD to do any coding when there's all these people who are going to computer school? You know right, what I mean? Right, like right. The actual skill that you need. To, so that does. But that being said, that doesn't mean that you can ignore tech. It's just you have to put your eyes on the ball where the actual skill is. So when the students talk to me about this class, they're like, oh, well, I'm going to learn to code. And I'm like, no, we're, we use a pretty simple platform. Um, it's Community Lawyer, and it's actually available. Any, any lawyer can use it. Yeah, I've seen it. It's yeah. great. My opinion, it's great. Uh, it's a simple platform. You don't really have to learn much coding. There's like some light, light logic to it. Uh, but the main point is you take this legal task and you break it apart into small parts. You put it in the right order. And then you ask questions at a third grade level wow. and the students are like, oh, is that a transferable skill? I'm like, that's the transferable skill. That's the single thing. Everybody, every, we're not teaching that. We teach everything as if it's the world's most complicated thing, which I understand because you get paid more to do complicated work than simple work. That being said, there's a lot of simple work. And dude, we got to get that work, man. We can't give that work away to Rocket Lawyer and LegalZoom. That's work that we need to keep in-house. So uh, in my opinion, that's the absolute critical skill. That's the skill I'm trying to translate to the students. And hopefully law schools will do a better job with that going forward.